Hey everybody, it's Miss Peachy from WCA Biology, and I'm just going to do a hopefully um, short video supplemental for Kingdom Fungi, and um, this is something that I actually had a class on today, but I forgot to record it, so I want to make sure you guys have this in your um, collection to be able to draw from if, if needed for reviewing for class. So in the Kingdom Fungi, um, this is a separate kingdom of living things, different from plants and animals. And I know so far we've talked about um, kingdom, um, we've talked about the bacteria and, you, and archaea bacteria. We've also talked about kingdom protista. And so this is our next kingdom of living things. Different from the ones we just talked about because um, almost all fungus are uh, multicellular organisms. There's just one group, the yeasts, that are single celled. Otherwise, they're all multicellular. Um, and fungi are, you know, different from, um, you know, bacteria and eubacteria and archaeobacteria because they are eukaryotic instead of prokaryotic cells, although they're similar to protists in the fact that they are, you know, eukaryotic. And they are different from plants and animals, um, like plants, they do have cell walls, but their cell walls are made of chitin instead of cellulose. Um, they're not photosynthetic, they're heterotrophs, but unlike other animals, they are what are called absorbative heterotrophs, meaning that they excrete enzymes and actually digest their food outside their bodies and then absorb that nutrients into their bodies. Most of them are um, detritivores. They actually are going to break down um, dead things within their environment. Some of them are even decomposers. So um, they're very different in lots of ways from the other kingdoms, and that's why we classify them separately as an entire kingdom. First thing I want to show you is just a, some really awesome pictures here. Um, we can see that these were actually taken, and I can show you the website in just a minute, by a photographer here in Wisconsin. These are of Wisconsin fungus, just different varieties, just a really good photographer. Just various kinds here. And it's kind of neat to be able to look at his website. Um, because when we see his website, it classifies. Oh, how'd that one get in there? I don't know. Maybe my daughter snuck it in. We look at his website here, and it actually. Uh, let me just do a quick. Bring that up here. And I'm going to share it with you over on the screen. Oops, hang on a sec. There we go. It's kind of hard to see the whole thing here. Because my window is kind of small. But he has a lot of different Wisconsin mushrooms. And he takes beautiful pictures of them. And then, you know, there's many different categories we can pick here. For example, we can look at puffballs if you're interested in those. And he's got different kinds. And if you're, you know, just what they look like, different pictures of them. Um, so, and he categorizes them by genus and species. So he actually has the scientific category. It's a pretty cool website that you guys can just go ahead and check out. Okay. <clears throat> now, one of the things we did in class today, which I kind of talked about a minute ago, was just to look at the common things and differences among, you know, these three kingdoms, plants, animals, and fungi. And we kind of just went through that a little bit a minute ago. So I'm going to skip that slide here because of time. Just realize that, of course, being a separate kingdom, they're going to have many things that separate them from plants and animals. But they all do have things that overlap. Like all being eukaryotic, for example, is an overlapping characteristics of plants, animals, and fungi. Um, both plants and fungi have cell walls, although they're made of different things, and so on and so forth. When we look at how fungi are broken down into a phylogenetic tree, it's a bit confusing sometimes, and I think sometimes when we look at all living things, it can be overwhelming with the sheer volume of different living things. Um, this is kind of the best phylogenetic tree I could find to keep it simple um, for us. So we have our main kingdom of fungi. And then we have our main categories that are subgroups of that kingdom. And we're going to talk mostly about three of these four. The Basidiomycota, or my, uh, my CDs here, the club fungi, the Asco 
mycetes here, the sac fungus, and the zygote mycetes here, which are the zygote fungus. Um, we talk a little bit maybe about the mycorrhizae fungi here, but we don't really go into depth because of, of time constraints. We'll just talk a little bit about some of the more common ones, the ones that are most familiar to us, okay? And this one kind of goes into a bit more detail. So Ascomycota, Basidiomycota, and Zygomycota. Basically, Ascomycota are things like yeasts, truffles, and morels. Um, Basidiomycota are the mushrooms you're going to be most familiar with, the ones we like to you know, eat in our salads and our, um, our spaghetti or our, our uh, pizza or whatever. And Zygomycota are like bread mold, things like that. The fuzzy mold that you see on your strawberries that you're, ah, I wanted to eat those strawberries and now they're full of mold. You know, that kind of thing. Okay. So characteristics of fungus. So remember, they're not plants. They're not animals either. In fact, we'll find out a little bit later that plants um, are actually less closely related to fungus than animals are. They don't do photosynthesis. They are eukaryotic organisms. They don't move on their own except for yeasts. Um, and most of them live on live off of the remains of other things. They're saprobes. They actually live on dead organisms. You've also used the term um, detritivores and decomposers. They are absorbative heterotrophs. They excrete enzymes and digest the food outside their bodies and then bring it in. <clears throat> and they store their energy as a sugar called glycogen. Um, of course, they're also important decomposers in the environment. You see mushrooms and things growing in the forest. They're serving a purpose. They're helping to break down those nutrients and recycle them into the soil. Um, most are multicellular except for unicellular le or yeast. And of course, they're not like plants because they don't have true root stems or leaves, although sometimes they look like they do because they have you know, root-like structures and a stem-like structure and a kind of a body-like structure that could be mistaken for a plant. Um, their cell walls are made of chitin. Now chitin is the same material that makes up uh, the, the exoskeletons of insects. So actually that crunchiness, believe it or not, that you when you crunch into a, a mushroom is the same stuff, although much thinner um, that you would find on the outside of a beetle. When you're looking at a, at a mushroom or a, a fungus here, um, the body part is called the thallus. That's this part here that looks like a stem. Um, and then we have every part of that fungus here is made up of these little microscopic tubes called hyphae. And hyphae are connected end to end, and they make up every component of the fungus. It's actually pretty neat. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. It's even a closer view. Now, be careful, ladies and gentlemen. Don't just go into the woods and start picking mushrooms and thinking you're going to have an afternoon snack. While there are many edible mushrooms, there are many more that are poisonous. And it takes a trained eye to be able to identify the difference. So please um, be very wary of ever taking a mushroom out of the wild and taking it for um, eating it for a snack because it's, you know, Unless you know what you're doing, you could get very, very sick or die. Now, mushrooms, I should say mushrooms, but I need to say fungus because mushrooms really just excludes many different kinds of fungus. They can reproduce both sexually and asexually. And most often, reproduction is going to be asexual. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. During times of extreme, like, harsh or adverse environmental conditions, then you'll have sexual reproduction that occurs to help preserve the species. It also helps to increase genetic diversity. Fungi reproduce by spores. Actually, that's something they have in common with plants. Many different kinds of plants also reproduce by spores. <coughs> A couple of other terms and, and things to be familiar with. Um, fungi grow best where it's warm and moist, um, require lots of, of moisture to grow, which is why you tend to find a lot of mold in your shower and in your bathroom and stuff like that. Um, when you look at the word 
my or the prefix myco myco uh, mycology is the study of fungi mycologists is the study of of or some people who study fungi um, you'll see mycelia you'll see a lot of that same prefix to refer to the fact that we're talking about fungus and if you want to kill fungus you use a fungicide which is actually pretty important when you have like a garden or you've got plants outside your house that you're taking care of a lot of times there are certain um, fungicides that help to treat specific conditions that can be you know pathogenic fungus uh, fungi include puffballs, yeasts, mushrooms, toadstools, rusts, smuts, wingworm, and molds. And even certain antibiotics that we take to make us better are actually made of fungus. The antibiotic penicillin is made from the penicillium mold. This is a picture of a puffball here. And here's some penicillium mold on a petri plate. And you notice that there's like a zone of inhibition all around the penicillium mold where the bacteria can't grow because that area is toxic to them. It tells us that that works really well. So when we talk about vegetative structures, we're actually referring to non-reproductive structures, right? Things that aren't involved in asexual or sexual reproduction. And so that is, again, remember, all the parts of the fungus is made up of these tubes called hyphae. And some of them are one long continuous tube, and sometimes they're broken up by these little divisions called um, septa. And... Um, because they're so long, they have to have more than one nucleus to be able to provide enough stuff for that long cell to be able to survive. So they multi they're multinucleated, meaning they have more than one nucleus. Again, filling, filled with cytoplasm and having a hard um, uh, cell wall made of chitin. There are some modified hyphae. So you have longer kind of linear areas of hyphae that connect one end to the other are called stolons. And then the root-like structures that kind of hold or anchor the fungus in place are called rhizoids. Rhizoids means root-like. Um, if you see the term rhizoid, I think, being used in some of the really primitive plants as well. So those are some of the things that are just come, you know, it's basically just a, a modification. Again, septa are the cross walls that form between those long um, hyphae. And if you look at this, this is the picture I wanted to show you earlier. Here are, here's that mushroom. With a, it's a cartoon version of the mushroom. But you can see that every part of it is made up of these long tubes. Even where we see, where we see a mushroom cap is made up of like, just like tons and tons of little microscopic tubules. Same thing with the, the stolon. It's also made up of hyphae. And then this underground network of kind of like a, it's almost like a net of like a, of rhizoids is actually called the mycelium. It's the mycelium. And a lot of times that's in the area where it's absorbing all the nutrients. Uh, that's where sexual reproduction takes place. It's also anchoring it to the ground. It reserves a lot, or it has a lot of functions to it. All right, so absorptive heterotroph meaning that it's excreting enzymes out of the tip of the hyphae and then it breaks down the material that it's trying to digest and then it actually absorbs it back into the hyphae. Um, so this is what's taking place in the fungus in order to be able to eat. Um, we also talked about these, these uh, um, septa before that kind of can divide up different areas if necessary. Some some fungi have them, some don't. Some have them in some places and, and not in others. Another modification are these um, Hostoria, which are like these little hyphae that come up and actually act almost like lassos, if you will, and they lasso on to some other microorganisms and then they digest them alive. So they're these are considered to be predatorial fungi. There are very few of them, but there are those that exist that way, and it's kind of a, a cool modification. This one is, is eating a nematode. Um, yeah, so the mycelium is that net or web underground of hyphae where everything, all the feeding and stuff is going on there. It's actually interesting is like the majority of like like all the living is going on under the ground where we don't see it and then the mushroom part that comes out that we call the mushroom which is just the you know 
the fruiting body and the um, the thallus and stuff like that that's actually just a very temporary part of the whole fungus and the tastiest part as well all right so reproduction we have asexual and sexual um, the majority is going to be asexual reproduction sexual reproduction is typically reserved for poor conditions where there's not a lot of nutrients and where the there really needs to be some time before, you know, maybe the fungus is going to die and needs to preserve itself for future time when the conditions are better. Um, also, with asexual reproduction, it's more abundant. You get like tons of different spores that are, are not different, but tons of spores that are released at once you tend to have a, a lot of spreading that's happening with asexual reproduction. Um, Spores are made, both sexual and asexual spores. S sexual spores are going to be more um, durable. They last longer. Um, they're designed to be, you know, sitting around for a while in extreme conditions before they grow. Whereas asexual spores are not going to be qu quite that, you know, um, durable. But there's more of them. Um, spores are primarily non-modal, but there are some that are modal spores. Uh, meaning that they can't move on their own. Okay, so non-modal means they don't move on their own. They're distributed using like wind or sometimes animals and stuff like that will carry them on their backs and distribute them. Okay, I'm going to actually, well, that we'll start with sexual reproduction. It's kind of interesting and weird at the same time. But like underground where you have those network of mycelia, right, you'll have two different fungus main fungi or whatever, mushrooms, whatever you want to call them, um, but two totally separate organisms. Their mycelia, their hyphae, connect. And even though you don't have like a male organism and a female organism, the hyphae, the different long, um, you know, tubules or whatever, they, ha they have different identifications, either positive or negative, we call them, instead of male or female. And a positive hyphae from one organism will connect with a negative hyphae from another organism and they will fuse and exchange genetic material. And then in between where that fusion takes place, a zygote forms. And a zygote is a single cell that contains the genetic material from both organisms. So it's genetically different from parent. And that's the sexual spore, so it's much more durable and lasts for a long time. Um, here we can actually see the, the fusion of a positive and negative hyphae to make that zygote, that sexual spore in the middle. And you can kind of see the structure of the spore, it's really interesting. Okay, so again, this spore may just sit around for a while before it begins to grow into a new, um, a new entirely new organism and growing more hyphae and a new mycelia that kind of comes out from that. Asexual reproduction is more frequent and more, and I guess, not quite as dramatic, if you will. So again, most of the, like the living part of the plant lives, or the, see I said plant, I didn't mean to say plant, living part of the organism of the fungus lives underground, right? And then it grows a, um, the thallus, that stalk structure, and again, this is one type. This is on the um, Bascomycota, so it's a little different depending on if you're looking at a sac fungus or um, if you look at. I'll, I'll look at the different kinds in a second and kind of show you what I mean by that. So the the um, the reproductive parts different depending on which type of fungus we're talking about, but it kind of comes above the ground for the most part and then produces that reproductive structure. And that reproductive structure has spores on it that are asexual spores. That means that they have the exact same um, genetic combination as the parent. So they're just basically clones. And there's like trillions of spores and they just get released all at once and the wind takes them and they, they go someplace else and grow and form a brand new fungus. But the exact same identical fungus as what they came from because it's asexual reproduction. Um, there are three types. Of course, we have fragmentation I didn't talk about. If it becomes separated, they can form a brand new copy of itself. 
or yeasts use budding to form new copies. Otherwise, the asexual spores was the one we talked about. Now, the type of fruiting body varies depending on what type of uh, fungus you have. In fact, what's interesting is that groups are actually, where am I at here? I'm sorry. The major groups of fungi are actually categorized based on the reproductive structure. Um, oh, here we go. Nope, I lied. Well, let's just let's let's. So our first group is Basidiomycota, and these form um, their fruiting body on top is the basidiocarp. Oops. That's the name of it right here. So the group, basidiomycota, is actually named for the name of the reproductive structure. Okay. This is what your, this is your mushroom cap. This is the thing that you like to get filled with cream cheese and garlic and all sorts of tasty stuff and you cook it and you eat it, right? So this is where the those asexual spores are formed. Um, there's actually little gills underneath, and there's actually little spores that form within the gills. Um, here's some more pictures of them. Some of them are going to be very familiar, like mushrooms and toadstools, and some will be less familiar, like bracket and shelf fungi, puffballs, stinkhorns, rusts and smuts. But they all have a, they all form that same kind of reproductive structure. Um, the second type of group of fungi that we'll talk about are the, um, let's see here. These are zygomycota, and they're reproductive. They're actually called the sporangium fungi. Sometimes they're called sporangium. And they're named after the fact that they have the reproductive structures are called sporangia. So they, again, are named after their reproductive structures. These you wouldn't notice as much because they're, like, on a mold like this, it's hard to tell, but each little fuzzy part here is actually an individual sporangia. So you don't notice them as much because they're not, you know, as large. But the sporangia are, you know, again, filled with those asexual spores. And an example of them would be um, bread mold or, or you have mold here growing on strawberries. Um, it's just there's different ones, obviously. And then we have, here, here's another example. You can kind of see this here. The spores on the bread mold, um, the rhizoids that anchor it to the bread. All of this is very small, so we're not going to notice this. It's not going to look like this, but it'll look more like this on your mold or on your bread. And then the last one we're going to talk about is the ascomycota, the sac fungi. We're actually not going to look at the other ones here, just again for time reasons. But ascomycotes or ascomycota, these are the sac fungi, and their reproductive structure is called an ascus which is like a cup-like structure that houses all of the spores. So sometimes they're called the sac or the, the cup fungi, um, but that's again named after the reproductive structure. So the different main kind of categories of fungi are named after what the reproductive structure looks like, because that's what makes them kind of different from each other. Otherwise, they're all made up of hyphae, and they're all kind of doing the, their own thing, you know, similar types of things, making asexual spores, making sexual spores, that kind of thing. Um, included with the ascomycota are also yeasts, even though they're a little bit weirder. They're individual. Um, they produce asexually by budding. They don't have sexual reproduction. Um, they're not multicellular, so they're a little bit odd, but they still fit within the ascomycota group. And then, let's see here. The other groups that are talked about here that we're not really going to get into are the crydids here, um, the uh, mycorrhizae, 
um, and the lichens. But they're actually kind of neat too, so I mean, they're really it's just because of time that we were not getting into them. Um, we'll talk a bit about mycorrhizae actually when we get into plants, because some of the mycorrhizal fungi, they actually live in a, a nice mutualistic relationship with plants, and they help to, to fix nitrogen in the soil so that the soil has lots of nitrogen for the plants to grow, and it really is very important um, with lots of plants. And lichens, of course, are a symbiotic relationship between algae and fungi. We've talked about them a bit before because algae is a protist, and of course, fungi is fungi, and they work together, and they are oftentimes like the very first organisms to be found um, in a, a new an ecosystem, like after a volcanic eruption or whatever. We we see primary succession. You see that lichens are some of the first and hardiest of all organisms. Okay, so that really kind of sums up all of the the different parts of fungi. Um, last being that, you know, when you look at a cladogram, as I said earlier, that there's actually a closer relationship between animals and fungi than there is between fungi and plants, which is kind of weird. People don't think that necessarily, but if you just look at some of their common relationships, both fungi and animals are heterotrophs, whereas plants are autotrophs. So that means that they're going to be quite different, really. They make their own food and we, you know, um, need to find other things to eat to be able to get our, our food. We are also both multicellular. Um, fungi has chitin, which is found in insects, so there's lots of similarities more so to animals than there are to plants. So hopefully um, you're able to learn a little bit about the kingdom fungi today. And um, if you have any more questions or anything else, feel free to give me a call or you can send me a webmail message. Have a great day, everybody.